Uh, it's my privilege now to introduce the speaker of uh, the 33rd annual meeting of the Stanford Historical Society. Um, the speaker this afternoon, as you know from your program, is Philip A. Pizzo, Dean of the School of Medicine at Stanford, and the Carl and Elizabeth Nauman Professor of Pediatrics and of Microbiology and Immunology in the School of Medicine. As many of you also know, uh, this year is a, a remarkable anniversary for the school. It's both the 50th anniversary of its presence at Stanford, uh, coming down from San Francisco, and the 100th of its foundation. Um, it's not often that history buffs like us get a twofer like this, and we were very happy that Phil had time in his busy schedule to join us this afternoon and talk about the history of the Stanford Medical School which has become one of the most distinguished medical schools, certainly, in the world. Phil came to Stanford uh, just eight years ago in the spring of 2001. Uh, before joining Stanford, he was physician-in-chief of Children's Hospital in Boston, very distinguished hospital, and chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Harvard from 1996 to 2001. He's internationally recognized for his contributions uh, as a clinical investigator, especially in the treatment of children with cancer and HIV. Before Harvard, Phil served at the National Cancer Institute in the infectious disease section. He was chief of the NCI's pediatric department and acting scientific director for NCI's division of clinical services, clinical sciences, excuse me. He's devoted much of his distinguished career in medicine to the diagnosis, management, treatment, and prevention of childhood cancers and the infectious complications that occur when children's immune systems are compromised by cancer and AIDS. He's the author of more than 500 scientific articles and 14 books. Now he has time to do that, who knows? Uh, Phil's received many awards um, from the US Public Health Service, including the Outstanding Service Medal in 1995, He's been cited in the best doctors of America since 1995. And in 19, 1990, he was declared Washingtonian of the Year by the Washingtonian Magazine. He's a member of a number of prestigious organizations, and you'll just have to take my word for it because all I have is the acronyms, the AAMC, the AAHC, and is a council member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. We know what that is. So it's a great honor to have uh, Phil Pizzo, Dean Phil Pizzo, the Stanford School of Medicine, to address us this afternoon on the subject, 100 Years of Medicine at Stanford. Please welcome Phil Pizzo. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It's indeed a privilege to be here with you today. Uh, and I uh, certainly feel humbled being before the Stanford Historical Society and having an opportunity to reflect with you on what has transpired both over the last hundred and more years as it relates to the School of Medicine. And in doing so, I am cognizant that there are some of you in this room who may well know more about this than I. My connections with Stanford really only began uh, eight years ago, but it's been really remarkable to learn more about this incredible institution. Now, as individuals who are interested in and devoted to history, you know, as do I, uh, that it's really the narrative story of individuals, um, of people, uh, as compared to institutions. And that certainly is true uh, in the genesis of uh, the School of Medicine as well. Uh, it's also true that events have interconnectedness uh, to uh, uh, preceding ones. And I'm reminded of the kind of side story in Tolstoy's War and Peace, uh, where he, uh, in his own philosophical way, uh, delineates how one event, uh, one of millions of events, leads to the next uh, that describes an activity that an individual today or tomorrow uh, might actually execute. Uh, War and Peace, as you know, was published in 1869, um, nine years after uh, Elias Cooper um, founded uh, 
uh, what was then Cooper Medical College in San Francisco. Now, a little context. Didn't take much to start a medical school um, in the latter part of the uh, midway through the 19th century. Uh, and in fact, the epicenter um, for science wasn't in the United States, it was in Europe. Remember that uh, in 1858, um, uh, Darwin and Wallace both presented their paper on evolution to the Linnaeus Society. Um, it was the year of the Lincoln-Douglas debate. Uh, and uh, aside from that, much of the action of medicine, or science as we know it today, uh, was happening in Germany and Italy and France, but not in the U.S. In fact, there weren't really very many criteria um, for becoming a doctor. Uh, when Cooper first founded his medical school. There were no admissions criteria. Um, you didn't even have to read, and many people who went to medical school didn't uh, at that time. Um, the courses were generally short. Uh, it was an apprenticeship model, uh, and you kind of graduated and went off and did your uh, medical practice without much uh, uh, real criteria um, surrounding it. Well, it turns out that uh, Cooper... Um, didn't succeed, uh, didn't survive long enough to see his medical college become part of Stanford. Um, he died uh, in 1862, um, obviously in the early phases of the Civil War. Uh, and uh, his effort was picked up in 1870 by a relative um, named uh, Levi Lane, uh, who brought together, ultimately uh, there was a bit of strife, but then a resolution, and uh, Cooper Medical College uh, was ev eventually um, founded and started uh, further delineated in San Francisco, where it um, remained uh, as the epicenter of activity until, as you stated, 1959, um, when the school moved here. Now, let me tell you a little bit of the background that I think is, to me, interesting and relevant. Uh, and I want to mostly dwell, as I will, on the 1959 move, but I want to give you a little bit of context um, for that. So the assimilation of Cooper Medical College into Stanford happened in 1908. Now, as you know far better than I, um, that was only a bit more of a, uh, than a decade after Stanford University was in fact founded, and David Starr Jordan uh, was still the president um, when uh, Cooper Medical College became part of Stanford University. And uh, without going too far into accolades for Stanford presidents, he was one of three um, who has actually had an M medical degree. Even though he didn't practice, um, Jordan did have an MD degree. So did um, Wilbur and Tresseter um, to follow. Um, so out of the 10 uh, university presidents, I figure we're batting 30%, which isn't uh, too bad uh, in terms of the importance of medicine as part of a university uh, organization. Uh, but he said at the beginning, um, when the question about the assimilation of, of the uh, Cooper Medical College into the university was being considered, that it ought to focus on research. And uh, that was a prescient statement, because even though uh, a great deal of what happened in San Francisco during the subsequent 50 years was largely clinical, he set the stage um, for what was certainly to follow. Um, over those um, uh, next 50 years after Cooper, Me Cooper Medical College became Stanford School of Medicine uh, in um, San Francisco, a number of things happened that moved medicine forward uh, in some ways uh, significantly and in other ways not. Among them was that um, prior to that period of time, um, there had been much greater uh, degrees of awareness about what should be an academic medical center and what should be a school of medicine. And interestingly, that was um, led by a group of university presidents prior um, to the founding of Cooper uh, Medical College and Stanford University, largely Charles Eliot at Harvard, along with the presidents at Michigan and um, Penn, who set criteria criteria for admission, criteria for curriculum, um, and uh, criteria for graduation. 
And those became very important um, because they set the stage for what turns out to be a critically important uh, activity that impacted not just Stanford, but the whole nation just two years after um, the medical school was founded. And that was in 1910 when the Flexner um, report took place. Flexner was an educator um, and was commissioned um, by the Carnegie Foundation to basically define um, what medical education um, should be about. And amazingly, a hundred years later, uh, many in medicine still think of the Flexner Report as the foundation for medical education as we know it today, which means that in part, medical education hasn't changed as much as it might um, from uh, when it commenced uh, uh, after the Flexner Report. But the Flexner Report defined criteria um, that delineated the essential components of an academic medical center. And it was called upon um, subsequently to uh, justify in part the move of the school from San Francisco to the Stanford campus. Among the components was to have on the same site a medical school and its related teaching hospitals for them to be virtually contiguous um, and also for them to be related to their parent uh, university. Now, I must tell you that uh, those criteria are only partially met uh, if one looks at medical colleges and schools around the nation. Many of them are actually quite separate um, from their parent university, and in some cases, the School of Medicine is phys physically um, quite separated as well um, from its major teaching hospitals. But the excellence uh, that uh, Flexner forecast uh, was really in many ways ahead of its time because it considered the fact that advances in medicine and clinical care would be predicated upon advances in research and teaching and that the integration of education, research, and patient care would constitute um, what one might consider an academic um, medical center. So in part, for its first 50 years, um, Stanford, um, as it evolved from Cooper Medical College, uh, was, uh, while excellent uh, in the delivery of clinical care, less perfect uh, because of its physical separation from its parent university, and also less perfect because of the lack of depth of scientific excellence. Now, was that unusual? Probably not. Um, because in most medical schools and academic centers around the United States, science uh, uh, was still evolving um, during the uh, first part of the 20th century. And uh, as someone who, if you will, grew up and watched science evolve in the second part of the 20th century as, a, as an individual, it is remarkable to contrast the differences between um, the two eras, things that we almost take for granted today um, simply didn't exist uh, at the time um, when Cooper Medical College was in San Francisco and even when the decisions to move it um, to this campus were initially configured. So when did that happen? Well, actually the early phases of considering um, the future of Stanford Medicine um, began under uh, Tresseter's reign um, in the early 1940s. He was appointed president in, I believe, 1943, um, and he raised the question about what should happen with the School of Medicine. I would like to think in part because, as I mentioned earlier, he had an MD um, degree. And um, he looked to um, a report um, that had been generated by Wilbur, his predecessor, um, that actually uh, proposed that there be a significant rebuilding uh, of the program in San Francisco. I see Ross Bright here, who is uh, a distinguished alumnus of the school when it was in San Francisco. And that was at a point in time when there was a need for new facilities and um, those were proposed and there was an endowment plan that had been put forth that was supposed to raise the funds um, for that to take place. When we think about where we are today with our endowment and um, with the need to raise funds, it turns out that that didn't happen. And so um, Tresseter, um, uh, looking at the reality that the Wilbur Plan didn't bring the money in, did what I guess most presidents did, um, commissioned a committee um, to look at what should be the fate of the School of Medicine. And so a committee was appointed, led by 
uh, a pediatrician, a highly regarded pediatrician named um, Faber, and he and his colleagues um, came forward with a report on the future of the medical school, which came about 1946. And interestingly, that report said um, that the medical school ought to be reconfigured um, and facilities reconstructed in San Francisco. So that was the plan at that juncture. It failed not because of desire, um, but because, again, there was a lack of resources generated to accomplish the goal. And so when Sterling became president in 1949, um, this issue of what to do with the medical school was still very much on his mind, his mind and others um, uh, at, uh, at that time. And so uh, a variety of different proposals um, um, came forth. There was a Sterling committee um, and this is an STIR as compared to a Sterling in terms of quality, although it was a high quality um, committee, um, that again reviewed the question of what should happen with Stanford Medicine. And it uh, once again came forward with the recommendation to uh, renew its facilities and renew its programs in San Francisco. There was a sidebar um, committee that um, Sterling had, um, as at least as I've been able to gather the data, um, with the Board of Trustees and with a few selected faculty members, including Henry Kaplan, who became a very important member of the community. He was in uh, San Francisco and was critical to the future of the medical school as well. And they and the Board of Trustees made a different decision than all the committees had done prior to that which was uh, announced on July 15th, uh, 1953, um, which was to move the School of Medicine um, from San Francisco to uh, the Stanford campus. That was uh, based upon a remarkable uh, prediction um, by a historian and coupled with uh, Henry Kaplan, a radiologist and uh, someone who was the father in many ways of radiation oncology, um, and also Fred Turman um, from Engineering, who recognized uh, that the next 50 years uh, were likely going to be the years of biology and the biosciences, and that having a school of medicine proximate to the university would be a win-win for all. Um, so the decision configured by um, Sterling, the Board of Trustees, um, Turman, uh, Kaplan and others set the stage for what I think has been a historical transformation of the School of Medicine. It led to a variety of different um, important um, changes, and I want to describe them to you both in terms of people and culture um, and um, facilities and how uh, that continues to play out um, today. So in terms of um, uh, people, um, the first phase uh, of this new wave of activity was uh, in moving uh, the school, um, a sort of mixed story. Mixed story in the following way. Many of the faculty and the faculty leaders who were largely clinical, uh, when hearing about the decision uh, to move the School of Medicine, uh, felt as they had with each prior discussion that had taken place, abandoned. Um, by this plan. Their practices were in San Francisco, their work was in San Francisco, um, the activities taking place here in Palo Alto were much less um, developed than they are today, and there didn't seem to be a future. And they made it clear um, that if the school moved, they weren't coming along with it. And that was true for the vast majority of uh, many of the leading clinical faculty who had really um, uh, been, in their own ways, medical pioneers in the city of um, San Francisco. So that had a big impact, as you could imagine, on what was going to move um, to, um, to uh, the Palo Alto campus. Coupled with that was another people opportunity, which was... So if they're not coming, who is? And uh, how do we put that together? And here a number of important players um, uh, became involved. Um, some of them were um, deans. The, there had been uh, great involvement of uh, Yank Chandler, who was dean for 20 years, um, from 1933 to 1953. Now I must tell you as a side 
bar, being a dean for 20 years is pretty remarkable. When I uh, came here um, in 2001, uh, I was told that the average life of a dean of a school of medicine was four years. That was a pretty shocking uh, uh, realization, but the reality was there was a time when people served for quite um, long periods of times, and Chandler was certainly thoughtful and involved in the planning of the potential move of the school and was said to be uh, favorable to it. Windsor Cutting was the dean from 1953 to 57, uh, and it's a little harder to um, really determine um, his commitment to this move, um, except to say that he resigned, um, and re resignation for deans always has to be interpreted um, carefully. Uh, in 1957, when things began solidifying, and uh, the new dean uh, appointed then was Robert Alway, who um, I'm pleased to say was a pediatrician uh, and uh, played a very important role along with Kaplan, Termlin, and Sterling in the next people phase of the School of Medicine. And what was that? It was the recruitment of a handful of truly remarkable uh, individuals. Uh, it began, although the timing of these things is always a little bit um, circumferential, uh, with the recruitment of Arthur Kornberg, um, who was uh, then the chair of microbiology uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. And as um, the story goes, and you likely have heard previously, um, Kornberg was a remarkable um, scientist, world-renowned already, working on um, the synthesis of DNA and um, uh, made a decision which was really quite interesting, which was that if he was to entertain a move, he had to take uh, all five of uh, the other members of his department of microbiology to Stanford. Uh, and uh, ultimately, the decision was made for him to move. Um, and uh, in doing so, he brought with him a remarkable group of individuals, all of whom are still here today. As you know, Arthur died um, a year and a half ago. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize just about the time of the move here in 1959. Um, and that was one very important um, uh, move of, because of the individuals who came with him. Another Nobel laureate, Paul Berg, uh, joined him. He was a young faculty member at that time, but subsequently became a very important part of this um, uh, medical school and complex. Part of the reason for Kornberg coming um, was because he realized that this was a university that was about to do things differently. We pride ourselves, you have prided yourselves as being part of an entrepreneurial environment that's quite interdisciplinary. And he was very attracted to the fact that there were strong departments of chemistry, for example, um, here. And that was important um, for his work. The second part um, was that there was a new facility um, under uh, planning and construction uh, designed by Edward Doral Stone. Um, and this new facility was going to create a new model um, for both medical education as well as um, for research because it was going to, in the earlier Flexner model that I described for you, put together a medical school a set of buildings, hospital buildings, and to do it on its parent university campus. So this was a pretty attractive um, uh, opportunity. Well, coupled with the recruitment of Kornberg and his colleagues um, was a, uh, another very important recruitment, and this was Josh Letterberg, who was then at the University of Wisconsin, who was recruited to found a new department of genetics. So now we've got a new department of biochemistry and a new department of genetics. And he, too, um, won the Nobel Prize within about a year after his appointment. And so Stanford Medicine uh, went from a school in San Francisco to a new model in Palo Alto with a brand new facility that was thought of as very novel um, in those days uh, with two Nobel laureates and a group of other remarkable faculty coupled with a handful of others um, that included Norm Kretschmer, um, who became the head of pediatrics, one of the most notable figures in pediatrics uh, in the world, um, with um, uh, the recruitment of Hal Holman, who had been at the Rockefeller um, University, um, who came to literally found the Department of Medicine, 
um, and uh, of uh, Hamburg, David Hamburg, who was the founder of the Department of Psychiatry and became an extraordinary figure in his own career. Uh, and Kaplan, um, along with um, Goldstein, um, Ivram Goldstein, who was uh, the head of pharmacology in San Francisco, both of them moved here, along with a small cadre of others. So this uh, medical school rapidly uh, became one of the leads um, in the country, virtually overnight, in part because of a combination of people, facilities, and a set of new visions. And one of those new visions was um, an opportunity to educate students in a new and different way. Now, when I mentioned the Flexner report to you earlier, it configured the way medical education had largely been done up until that time. And what is that? That was the uh, presumption that learning medicine is a combination of acquiring skills in basic science as well as clinical medicine. And the tradition of medical schools still today around the country is that there are four years. Individuals have gone to college before that, usually gotten a bachelor's degree. Um, and then they do two years of the preclinical sciences, you know, things like anatomy and biochemistry and microbiology and pharmacology and the like. And then they do two years, if, if you will, of apprenticeship learning on the clinical services. And then they graduate with an MD degree um, and then go on and do additional learning, generally for three to 10 years in residency and post-residency um, programs. Well, Stanford made the decision um, uh, by way of a commission that was uh, active right during the time that this whole move was gonna go on to formulate a different approach to education. And this too became a big topic um, for discussion. It was known then as the five-year plan and it basically did the following. It took students um, after three years, not four years of college, they hadn't even graduated, hadn't gotten a bachelor's degree, and said, you could come to medical school. Um, you'll spend five years here, um, and you can do the rest of your undergraduate work in the university uh, courses and campuses. That's why the association with the parent university was so critical. And then said, we're going to teach you and train you to do parallel thinking, hands-on and directed um, in um, science as well as medicine. So the five-year plan, which um, didn't last that long, uh, the uh, rebellion of the 1960s and er earlier meant that the five-year plan barely made it um, for five years, but it became a kind of cultural icon of medical education and had a huge effect on Stanford Medicine for the subsequent 50 years because it defined a profile of a medical school that was gonna be focused on educating physician scientists and leaders. So here's a additional um, important uh, comment, which is the culture of uh, an institution is largely, not surprisingly, shaped by the individuals who define it, and I will tell you that at least from my uh, view, looking backwards, and of course also trying to look forwards, that Stanford Medical School is world renowned today um, because of its excellence in science, because of its novel approaches to medical education. Now, I don't wanna horrify you, um, but I wanna tell you that um, when I was coming here um, uh, eight years ago, a colleague of mine uh, said to me, well, Stanford Medicine, and here he really meant clinical medicine, looks a lot better the further you are away from it. <laughs> and uh, what he meant to say was, you know, the reputation um, is strong, um, but the quality of the clinical programs not as outstanding as the quality of the science. And I want to say to you that for the uh, first um, couple of decades, I, I think that was in fact true. Um, this was an institution that was deeply committed to excellence in science, and that became the metric by which almost everything else was defined. Two years ago, when we sampled our faculty in one of a series of surveys to ask them, what are the values that are most esteemed at Stanford? The one that got the highest marks by far was research. And here they meant the medical school, not just the university. Um, education and clinical care didn't get 
quite that same degree of stringent association. And that's because research has been the culture of the realm uh, in this institution from certainly its second inception in 1959 and has had a huge impact uh, upon the way the school has been organized, the way the programs have been articulated, and by the way results um, have been achieved. Now I want to um, do a slight departure um, if from my spoken word because I recently came across a video clip um, that takes us back to 1959 and sort of casts the way people were looking at the school um, and its move at that point in time. And I want to show you that and then I'm going to come back and talk further about what's been happening since and where things might um, go in the future. So if you could run that clip. which is, as you could see, now loading. <laughs> Sounds like a 1950s movie, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you. 
five-year medical school program. Elective courses in arts and sciences allow students to complete their bachelor's degree. And more important, help them to understand from a broad perspective their patients and professions. Other medical schools have attacked the same problem and arrived at other solutions. Stanford is the first to remove its medical school from the heart of a large city and build it anew on its university campus. Six years of planning went into the Stanford Medical Center. Now that the center is in operation, medical educators throughout the world are watching to see how the Stanford plan works. For my next promotional activity. <laughs> so I, I think it is quite remarkable to just reflect for a moment on um, the way things were perceived then, both in terms of the facility, the role of physicians, sort of cultural phenomenology um, that existed, and now to fast forward um, to where we are today, and to also reflect on the fact that some of the issues um, that were faced then are exactly um, ones that we're dealing with today in somewhat different uh, iterations. So I should tell you that um, when the, the plans were in place to move the, the hospital facilities to Stanford, it wasn't um, that there was immediate uh, receptivity on the part of the Palo Alto community or its physicians. In fact, there was a great degree of antagonism to that. So it wasn't only that the San Francisco faculty didn't want to come here, um, there was a strong view in this community that uh, we don't really want this um, medical center here. The other interesting um, thing is when the hospital first uh, was developed, it consisted of both a um, city hospital as well as a university hospital. It wasn't really until 1965 um, that um, Bob Glazer, who was then dean, converted the institution into, quote, a university hospital. So it was a sort of mixed configuration. Um, and in some ways, that culture uh, also uh, exists um, today uh, as well. Now, I am uh, intrigued by the fact that the city of Palo Alto uh, co-invested with the university in trying to build the facility. I wish I could tell you that that was the case today. Um, here we are 50 years later, and we're looking at this same facility uh, that was praised uh, enthusiastically as an architectural marvel um, that I spend most of my time thinking about how to take down. Um, and I know when I'm speaking to a, a historical society, there, there are those of you who view this facility as iconic and something that should um, represent uh, historical preservation. But I don't think that is really the case. Uh, Stone did do some good work. I'm not sure anyone would rate this as um, an example of that. Um, he might argue that it wasn't really his fault um, because he initially considered a more vertical um, hospital facility, as has happened in many other institutions, but the board and others wanted a flat horizontal one, and this one, as you know, uh, extends over a rather large footprint in landscape, and if any of you have tried to traverse it, you know how difficult uh, indeed that that is. Now, add to the fact that uh, the facility, um, particularly the 1959 facility, made out of um, c compressed concrete is not seismically intact um, for the future and in fact can't be used after 2030 by um, regulation of the state seismic laws, we have a significant challenge um, today because we are once again talking about the need to build a facility here on the Palo Alto campus. And guess what some of the issues are? Well. One of them is the struggle between the university and the city, uh, for which there has not yet been resolution. If you're reading the Palo Alto News, you know that the entitlement process still ongoing is a very intense one. Um, I think almost ludicrous, to be honest with you, in terms of the issues that are being brought forth. Uh, but um, nonetheless, they continue to give evidence to the fact um, that 
as great as the medical center is, this is a city, Palo Alto, that doesn't today, as it didn't in the 50s, think that this medical center is necessarily uh, the great deal for them that uh, others indeed might. Now, I would say that's largely the city council, because when we've polled the citizens of Palo Alto, they have a thankfully different um, point of view. The second is, is that um, in order to build a new facility or even to renovate one, the costs are extraordinary. Remember the figure um, that you heard on the um, tape, which was $21 million. That was what it cost to build um, the entire medical school and hospital facilities then. Uh, as we're looking at the renewal of the medical school buildings, the hospital buildings, both at Stanford and at Packard, we're probably close to $4 billion um, because hospital construction is remarkably more expensive today than it was um, in prior years. So, um, you know, we're uh, right now probably somewhere around just over a billion dollars for the Packard expansion, over a billion dollars for the Stanford um, redo, um, and then add in the medical school buildings. And that's a pretty um, tall order um, to configure. Is it, uh, is it important and will it make a difference? The answer is, in part, it's essential um, because if we don't rebuild the facility, uh, then we won't be able to care for patients here. Now, guess what one of the issues are that's kind of percolating around, which to me quite remarkable, which is should we, could we, afford to build a facility on the Stanford campus? And so... Among the propositions um, that have been promoted by a number of individuals, including um, some at a very high uh, order of authority, is why don't we move the hospitals to another place? Take Redwood City, for example, or even Gilroy. Um, and I think that uh, that, to me, from both a historical point of view as well as a future perspective point of view, would really violate the integrity of everything that's been accomplished. I hope I've told you a story that has in part led you to believe that what took place in the mid-1950s um, triggered uh, the development of a facility that has become transformative. Stanford Medicine is looked at around the world as a remarkably successful enterprise, and it's successful because of this co-location. It was really visionary um, to uh, accomplish that because it is what has fostered the incredible interdisciplinary research and education that has made this such a unique institution. You heard me mention earlier Henry Kaplan as one of the pioneers who facilitated the move of the Stanford Medical School to this campus. He also did his most fundamentally important work because he collaborated with Ginston, a physicist here, to basically create the linear accelerator. And, uh, you know, one would argue that the linear accelerator model has had a huge impact on oncology as well as on applied um, physics um, writ large. The fact that the Hertzenbergs, um, one of the early members of the Stanford community, um, were involved in working with engineers to develop the fluorescent activated cell sorter, which became critical um, when HIV unknown at that time was um, defined 20 years later is another example of how interdisciplinary research between particularly the physical sciences and the medical sciences has been absolutely characteristic of Stanford Medicine. And I would say that uh, one of the most extraordinary and remarkable achievements that's gone on here has been this really um, this real willingness um, on the part of faculty to engage in uh, this kind of cross-cutting, inter-school, interdisciplinary um, uh, research. And that would be fractured um, if there was a significant move of one or another entity um, going forward. So uh, we're obviously in the midst of, as often happens with history, um, discovering the past to define the future. So in a fast-forwarding way, I'll tell you that during my um, time here now, 
uh, remarkably eight years. I still feel like some days I've just arrived, although I'm sure there are many people who would wish that I would have left eight years ago. Um, but, um, you know, it's been a time when we've actually renewed the curriculum again. The five-year plan, which was designed to educate physician scientists, was a fundamental underplanning of our new curriculum, which now has most students spending um, five or more years and all of them engaged in scholarship um, and in research in any one of a number of areas. So our medical student education, under our broad banner of what we've called translating discoveries, bringing science from the laboratory to the patient, um, is in many ways predicated on this historical and I think visionary approach of training physician scientists in the at the end of the 1950s, which continued during the subsequent decades in which we would like to see further propelled um, as part of our phenotype uh, moving forward. Um, the interdisciplinary nature of Stanford is what has fostered um, our development of our Stanford Institutes of Medicine, each of which move outside the medical school to engage faculty in each of the schools through the university. So whether we're focusing on stem cell biology or cancer or the neurosciences, it's become enormously embracing in terms of these interactions. Those would not have happened without the right mix of faculty and without the right physical configuration. I think those are critically uh, important um, goals uh, and issues. And our ability to bring knowledge um, from the laboratory to the bedside is directly proportional um, to the close connection um, between our hospitals and clinics um, and the uh, research facilities that configure um, the rest of the medical school and university. So Stanford Medicine, 50 years after um, the move from Palo Alto and 100 years after the founding of the school, I think is continuing to focus on the defining principles. David Starr Jordan, um, when the Cooper Medical College was uh, first assimilated to Stanford said, as I told you earlier, um, that we should focus on research. Sterling, Terman, others witnessed and recognized the importance of research in the biosciences, both um, for medicine as a profession, and I dare say for the university writ large, because I'm quite convinced, although I admit bias, that the fact that the medical school is here has further propelled Stanford to be a leading research university independent of what it does in, in medicine. And I think our challenge um, today is to build on the past and make sure that we don't lose sight of those fundamental um, uh, underpinnings so that we can continue to create a future in which Stanford Medicine will loom large 50 years from now and 100 years from now, hopefully further transforming healthcare, medicine, science, and the university. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, um, and uh, I'm willing to uh, certainly entertain questions if you'd like. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Uh, part of the history of, of the uh, medical school was the failed merger of the Stanford Hospital with... Interesting I that I skipped over that. <laughs> well, and, and I believe a, a University of California hospital, and I've always been terribly curious about what was the rationale yeah. for that merger, and then why didn't it work? And if you're willing to comment on that, I'd, yeah. I'd, be, I'd be grateful. So a couple of things about that. I, I guess truth in telling, I could say if the merger had worked, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. I'd still be in Boston, um, quite likely. Um, you know, the merger um, uh, took place at a time when lots of these uh, kinds of activities were happening to medical schools around the country. Uh, external forces, as we all know, can really impact um, on... Uh, the integrity of institutions. And I'll, I'll just say as a um, sidebar to that, I, I'm very mindful of that as we're looking forward to what I hope will be significant healthcare reform um, over the course of the next year. And one of the things that I'm very focused on is 
asking the question, what do we really want to be? What are our true values? Um, so that we're not impacted um, in ways that we don't want to be impacted by these external forces. So the forces that led to mergers was, um, I think, part of a chapter of medicine that I'm not very proud about, which is the increasing uh, market forces that have driven it. Medicine, in my opinion, has moved way too far um, from being a profession and service to being a business. Um, and uh, I can elaborate more on that subsequently if you'd like, but what I will say is that because of that, um, there became increasing competition um, between providers, hospitals, and physicians, and payers, um, stimulated here in California uh, because of the onset of managed um, care. And uh, one way of providers gaining the upper hand uh, was to create their own uh, market force um, by uh, creating size um, and need so that the payers would have to provide favorable rates. So I think that's one reason. I'll give you a more cynical um, reason as well. I think that uh, there was a lot of ambivalence at that time um, within the university as to whether or not it really wanted um, to have a clinical enterprise. There were concerns about um, the potential losses um, of the clinical facilities and how those might negatively impact uh, the university. One of the darker sides to the close association uh, with a parent university is that it has a, in, in essence, a fiduciary and financial risk if things go south. Um, and so I feel, believe that there were members of the community who said, well, why don't we move the clinical programs into a separate entity so that we won't have that vulnerability with regard to um, the universe, with regard to impacting negatively on the university. Now mergers were happening not just here, they were happening um, throughout the country. Um, I was uh, at that time, as you heard, at Harvard um, in Boston and um, uh, there were two mergers that were going on there, one between Massachusetts General Hospital and the Peter Ben Brigham or the Brigham and Women's Hospital that formed something called Partners Healthcare. And uh, that was actually never a merger. All it did was kind of bring the entities together to create a market force, but there was never a merger as happens in business where you close departments, combine resources and the like. Um, there was another merger that was happening in California, in um, Boston, which was between two other Harvard teaching hospitals called Care Group. This was the Beth Israel and the New England Deaconess Hospital where they did try to close and merge departments and that failed for a while. I mean, they almost went under um, because of the politics that were involved. Now, I first um, heard about the um, uh, merger going on here um, in a uh, sounding board piece in the New England Journal that was written by Spiros uh, Andreopoulos sitting right here in this room. And I remember reading that piece. I'm sure you remember writing that piece. Um, and I thought, this isn't going to work. Um, you know, this, uh, this, there's too many cultural differences between um, these institutions, a private institution and a public, separated by at least 35 miles without a clear vision and where um, only the clinical programs are going to be combined, not the um, research and academic ones. It just didn't make sense. And the reality is, is that it didn't achieve the support of the faculty and others, and uh, it failed um, great, to the great loss of the institutions, meaning that they incurred significant financial um, losses. Now, I would say, uh, thankfully, UCSF, a great institution, and Stanford, a great institution, are better today, um, and they're better today not merged um, than they were then. There are only two mergers in the United States that have sort of worked. One of them is the one I mentioned already, Partners Healthcare, and the other is between Columbia and Cornell um, in New York City. Um, and that's two because they didn't really uh, merge in the traditional way. They just formed a market force. Well, uh, I'm Herbert Lederman. Uh, I was a professor of psychiatry uh, here, and I came in 1963. And I want to commend you on educating me about some of the earlier <laughs> history and uh, a little bit about the uh, uh, history since 63 or, or 59. 
a couple of things you didn't mention that I'd like to emphasize. Sure. One is that you left out the social sciences mm -hmm. at, at Stanford. Absolutely. It was one of the main uh, reasons I came here. I came from Harvard. And uh, so, so the model uh, was uh, that the five-year model plus the uh, geography of the, of, of this institution was very important. And the second was the number of PhDs in, in the medical school. Yeah. And there were very few medical schools at that time. If you didn't have uh, an MD, uh, I mean, you didn't have a, a uh, the MD was solely the, 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 the uh, entrance uh, to, the, uh, to the institution. Now, there's also another part of the climate that's very important. Uh, many of the people that were recruited here were what I would call urban urban Easterners, and you can take that as a code word or whatever you'd like, and that changed the... Uh, I guess uh, I was uh, one of those, too. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it changed the... I, I'm from Chicago, by the way, so that's it. <laughs> but that, that, the atmosphere of the university was changed. Uh, particularly, I want to mention Robert McAfee Brown, who was very important in, uh, here at that time, and Terman and, and Sterling. They, they were explicit about this notion that they were going to diversify the university by bringing in another group of people that were otherwise not represented. And so I would like to get that on the... Uh, Great. Uh, and uh, I think in understanding this place, it's not uh, guaranteed, because Harvard just recently uh, decided not to build the medical science. Uh, and I, uh, I was so upset about it, because I thought that was what Harvard needed, was to have the medical school brought closer to the campus, using Stanford as the model, as it was for Duke, and, mm -hmm. and other institutions. So, but anyway, I want to commend you on Thanks. doing the job if you'll add the social sciences into it. Thanks. <laughs> I will, um, I'll be happy to add the social sciences. Uh, full disclosure, I was a philosophy major in college, even though I spent most of my life doing science. And I think that uh, uh, there's no question that you're correct about that um, and the importance of that. And the other part that you mentioned, which is true today as well, is that um, we have an equal number of PhD students uh, that we bring in each year to our MD um, students. And that does re, um, continue to be a very remarkable attribute um, for us. And the other point that you might be interested to know is that we now have joint degree programs for our MD students with all six other schools at Stanford. So there's enormous opportunity for our students to train in different ways. And we've established a new program for our PhD students called the Masters in Medicine uh, program. Some call it the MOM program, but we'll just call it the Masters mm -hmm. of Medicine, which allows them to learn about clinical um, medicine so that their basic science interests can also have a translational focus associated with it as well. Well, I think I've used your time and energy, so thank you again.